Hi, and welcome to the voice of Old Business Radio. I am your host, Jess Duell of Red Direction. Today, we are talking about leaky business models. And that might conjure up a whole bunch of images in your brain. I'm going to zero it in right now. We're talking about the waste, the cost of doing business, if you will, that companies have today. Whether it's service, whether it's production, whether it's manufacturing, somewhere in that supply chain, each of the people that are involved has a cost of doing business. And we're calling that leaky business in this program today. And I'm excited to share with you these two wonderful individuals whom are smart, they care about leadership, and they care about our impact in the world. We will be getting into the science side of things a little bit. We also will be focusing on leadership a little bit and how they intertwine together a lot to create what they call visionary pragmatism. So I'm going to introduce you to Alexander Prinsen, who researches sustainable solutions for our future and works with manufacturing companies and technology companies who have the intention to accelerate their organization towards an innovative future without the notion of waste. And Dr. Federico Fioretto, who is an entrepreneur, trainer, and coach, and is passionate about sustainability and the development of human potential, and he believes in the possibility to transform all conflicts and provide a method to reach the visionary goals of the company. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business, the show that provides everything smart leaders need to evaluate situations, build relationships, and create solutions. Jessica Duo candidly talks about the skills necessary to build tenacity and do more with less. And now, here's Jessica. Alexander and Federico, you guys are creating a new way to look at Uh, existing businesses and help transition them and transform them into where we must go as business entities, but also as a community of people doing business with each other and living together on this planet. And you're calling it visionary pragmatism. Will you guys define that for us? Let's just start right there. First of all, the fact of being visionary quite too often is kind of getting labeled those who are not rooted in reality, so those who have visions but cannot deliver on them. And uh, pragmatism is very much the characteristic of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. So what we wanted to, to put together into this concept was the fact that we have, in order to deliver on the future and on a sustainable future that we have in mind, we have to be, of course, visionary because the things as they are going are not going well. So we have to have a vision and to envision great changes. But on the other hand, we have to answer to people who are very much overwhelmed by the practicalities of their day-to-day life. And that's why we have embraced this concept, hoping to give an idea of how pragmatic we are while delivering uh, a bold, I would say, vision and this is the appropriate place to talk about bold things i think one of the reasons that this is necessary and required today is because businesses they're starting to they're starting to leak in a new way they're lacking flow they're becoming more rigid and instead of embracing change they're building i guess if you will dams or walls up against this moving target of change am i on track so far The change in this time as we're living now, most of the time goes together with fear. Yep. Um, And fear is the lack of hope. Um, And to overcome fear, you need to have a vision um, and to see the horizon as you want it to be. Um, And if if, if your company is only focused on your core business and and short-term cash flow, there is no space for a long-term vision. Is that where the leakage happens? If, I mean, if you only focus on what you have today and you don't have the capacity to look forward, um, there is a sort of leadership leakage, if, you, if, you, if I may, uh, that there is no uh, incentive to look further ahead into the future because of, um, I don't know, um, stakeholders' uh, interests. 
Mm -hmm. um, but it also means if you if you look that back to the leadership aspect then and, and human capacity, um, if you're only focused on the short term, your workforce is only focused on the short term. And we are humans are I and mean, we live eighty to one hundred years, so there's a much more potential within us to be used. This is interesting, if I may step in. Um, because when we when we think about leaky uh, business models, uh, we have to think in different ways. So uh, I'm sure that later on we will talk about leaking in terms of waste, resources, material, energy, etc. But we also have to concentrate on the fact that there is a leakage in terms of engagement in terms of the use of intelligence and of the power of people who are involved in the processes of business. So as Alexander correctly said, human beings have a longer horizon than the next quarter. We, we need to have a feeling that what we do has a purpose and is having an impact, of course a positive one, in the long term. So when the concentration is very much on the short term and on the day-to-day -day business, there's, there's a leakage or a waste, I would say, in the effectiveness and efficiency in the use of the human potential. This is another kind of leakage that sometimes is, is not envisioned enough. And the, the fact is that the kind of um, business mentality that has formed in the last two to three decades has been very much concentrated on the short term and on the day to day. So the problem is that there's a lot of talk about vision. Vision is written on every website of every company on the planet, more or less. But how many leaders today really dedicate time to develop a vision, not to talk, to spread, and to engage others into that? And I understand too, we see it every day that we've got this short-term demand, for example, through stock, the stock markets, the S&P 500, the global markets that we have are saying, give us short-term returns. What are you doing? How am I making money right now? Yet we're seeing at the same time, we are seeing companies drop off of the traded markets earlier than ever before. At one point in time, something like 20 or 30 years ago, it's probably more like 30 years ago, the average age of somebody that, a company that was traded publicly, they were on the market for something like 25 to 30 years. And today, that is all the way down to like 18 years. And again, I'm going off the top of my head, those statistics may not be right. The decrease though is there. That is where we're sitting. The other thing is there are more companies than ever before that don't make it to the five-year mark, that don't make it to the 10-year mark. And I personally believe, and the work that I do is complementary to what you guys do in the sense that without that vision and without that awareness of this longer term, at some point we hit a wall. And we hit that wall because Technology is trans, it's transforming our world faster than we know what to do with. By the time we get a new thing implemented in a medium to a large size business with 500 to 1,000 or 3,000 employees, we're already using dinosaur aged technology and have to start all over again. And it's hard to commit an investment to something like technology when it's not our core part of our business, for example. It's hard to commit to taking the time to figure out how is communication changing? What is the role of business in this world doing to support and actually engage with its consumers in the way that we expect it today? And all of those come from our, our innovation in medicine, in technology, the length of our lifespan, you know, you name it, um, invention, a science, all of that stuff plays a role in how quickly we have. So I want to start with, we hear that there's this break between vision and the short term. And that's where you guys are focused is how do we hold this short term yet not forget about and plan for this long term so we can maybe at least keep the numbers where they're at. And best case scenario, we're improving those numbers. Companies are all around longer. They're traded publicly across the world longer. We have more impact in that way, considering everything we do right now is valued around currency. 
And I know you guys have some other things around that. So, but before we move into some of those, the, the ways that vision can show up in terms of leadership and cost savings and things like that, what I would like your take on that. Are there like two or three things that you could bring home that says, look, you know what? The times are changing and we must change with them. Even if we can't change as fast as technology, we must attempt to keep up or we will lose our market share and close our doors. One thing that comes to my mind is always thinking about Africa. They don't have anything and yet they're still one of the fastest innovators in the world. Uh, because they are able to blend uh, technology together, which is available, for instance, the, uh, they don't have bank accounts. Bank accounts are now mobile phones. So to skip the bank, to skip the electricity. Um, but that, that has to do with the mindset you encounter scarcity. And, and when you're indulged in uh, abundance that everything is available, uh, you, 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 you tend to think that everything is for granted and and going to an innovation mindset although the americans are still one of also one of the very inspiring cultures where making stuff uh, is in general embedded in the culture and as such you see a lot of innovations happening from the ground up um, it's very hard to innovate in a structure where you have a top-down management flow so that if, if there is an initiative or an idea, it's very hard to get that idea up. So you're saying one of the things, one of these things that we could do to look toward becoming more visionary as a company, holding that short term and increasing the opportunity to, make, to bring other people along and hold this longer term vision. So not a single person or not a single group is doing it. The entire living culture within a company can do this. And that is to make sure it's not a one-way street. It's not top down only, that there are ways to go from the bottom up and making sure that we have this connection along the way and being able to get the ideas that are flowing somewhere below the bottom and the top. We value everything in currency, but we, we have to remember that currency is, is made by people. So we have seen a lot of concentration, or I would say an entire concentration on short-time results and financial results in business in the last decades. But what we have also seen, and that more or less I think is the same situation in Europe and in the US and in other developed economies, the best way to make short-term financial results was to displace the production in China or in other Eastern countries, and we have destroyed entire industry sectors, at least it has happened in Italy, for instance, and today we are paying the cost of that. Can I pause right there? So if I yeah. were to say it in my own words to make sure I'm following your train of thought, Federico, you're saying that this concept of efficiency and production at the lowest possible cost yeah. has an upper limit. I think it has reached its limit, and we are seeing that. Yes, and what I was thinking about when I said currency was we all have responsibilities. We all have obligations for where we live, what we eat, how we eat. And currency is what we spend our money on, is what we are telling companies that we agree with, support, and appreciate in their lifestyle. So I guess that's where I was coming from, is that money still is this thing that is determining value. Where I think I hear you going is to be visionary today, to see all of the stuff that is changing so quickly. When we hold that people show us their value by buying our product, at the same point in time, we can say, Look at the causes to improve our environment. Look at the causes to reduce overall waste in our cities and in our, on our globe. Look at the way that we can connect. For example, going back to the Africa example that Alexander shared of being able to bypass certain things with technology. When we start to bring in these other elements of how people may define sustainability, we are adding value to the money that comes to us and helping people feel good that they're contributing beyond what's going on because the people they're partnering with, the people they're buying products from, are value the same things in terms of environment, community, sustainability, reducing waste, things like that. What would you say to that? 
to me, money is, is a byproduct of the value of our activities. So what, what gives value to our activities or how do we produce value is the quality of intelligence that there is in our products or processes. And I see no contradiction, and, and, and that's very much the, the approach I think that we have in ESI, between money or having a, a profitable business and uh, environmental stewardship, uh, reduction of waste, circular economy, et cetera, et cetera, or sustainability as integrated sustainability as I think of it. Uh, on the contrary, I think there is more value and in the mid and long term, even more money. And today we are seeing it more and more, uh, especially into B2C industries, but also in B2B, more and more there is a value which is given to sustainable products, sustainable production, uh, sustainable services, and circular economy processes. And it's not necessarily more money, is more appreciation because you get better products, better services, you get more value. And that's come from uh, more attention to something which is real innovation, which is putting value back into companies. Because the focus on short-term financial results has taken away value from companies because there was no investment in innovation which entails research, entails some failures, entails normally mid-long-term investment, and investment on, on people, which is education, company culture, etc., which also entails mid-long-term investment. But then, when you have started, the, the long terms comes the, the interest of the day one day. If you never start that investment, then you get choked. And that's why, very correctly, I agree with the statistics you mentioned before, companies are getting out of the market at the, at the fastest pace today because there is no long-term consideration or investment. And that's also sustainability because sustainability is making business profitable. I have three things then that we've talked about here to, to just recap and make sure I've got them clear. This concept of a two-way street. We need top-down leadership and we need bottom-up support and communication pathways to get the best idea, uh, the best ideas overall for innovation, communication, and connection. The next is shifting away from money, the currency piece of just the bottom line, and actually recognizing that people are aligning with companies that share their values and that are impacting the world in a positive way. So they may not want to invest in a company that has farming practices or practices that actually are detrimental to part of the ecosystem of farming. And they can make all of these choices in that way as the example there. Just the concept of considering what sustainability looks like within an organization because across industries, sustainability means so many different things. And one thing that I heard you say, Federico, that is actually the same across all industries are the people that come to work every day. Alexander, did we get them all? I want to add one more um, because the interesting part is that a business is op always operates in a value chain. As you mentioned, we have businesses and in, in businesses, people work. But the businesses have suppliers and the businesses have clients. In the end, it, it comes from upstream towards downstream. Where, where do you get your materials from and where do you dispose them of? Or where, they, where do they get to? Um, and that's a whole flow of matter, uh, as I would call it. Um, and the way you manage it is the biggest question at the moment. Because we all know that we have a finite planet and the resources become finite. So, so that in the end, we pile everything up at the, at the waste dump, but if nothing comes back, we have a, we have a cultural crisis um, because there is no circularity in the way we produce, make, and uh, process stuff. As I was checking in across my social media, an interesting post crossed my path and I had to chuckle at it. 
it was a friend and colleague of mine. And he says, somebody called me up and said they wanted a bid for my services and to tell me right away at the beginning that he was only going to accept the lowest cost bid for the services. Okay, so we're going to use this as the basis of, of all these four things because a lot of us want that. We want the most we can get for the least amount of money. And we look the other way when it comes to, so how do we get the most for the least amount of money? And he himself, he was like, yeah, nope, sorry, no big deal. I'm out. Uh, I'm so glad that you called. I can, I'm taking myself out of the running for this one. Not interested. Because when we get in that mindset of these boxes, if you will. It's almost like a house of cards in a sense. And when you talk about a finite planet, Alexander, that's what I thought of was we've got all these things happening and we might not want to face them because we're not ready to deal with them. It, yet our planet is going to figure out how to heal itself. It was here before we got here. It's going to be here after we're gone. So what can we do to make us as a species, as a, a sentient being somewhere in this universe actually be able to contribute and get past this hurdle. I actually think it's somewhat of an evolutionary hurdle. And I say evolutionary because earth is going to do what earth has got to do no matter what. <laughs> so the science part of me and the science part of you, I think we can, we can relate to that a little bit. So where I think I would want to go with this is when we think about like efficiency, for example, right? It started in the 1800s and all those guys, they came up with this, here's how many units I need, here's how far away they can be spaced so I can get the maximum number of units, here's how much a skilled person will be able to produce in a certain period of time, and push that a little bit to get this concept of efficiency and productivity. And we are still rigidly hanging on to those in business. This concept of efficiency and taking away the humanness of it, taking away the connection that we have to our work and just making people cogs in a wheel. And something that you said about the finiteness reminds me of dominoes falling down for some reason. At some point before, when we had no concept, we, we didn't have the science to measure any of this, we weren't quite as globally connected all of those dominoes were pretty far apart. So if one fell, the other ones were all going to be okay. The thing is, as time goes by and we have more technology, realistically or not, those dominoes are now connected. And when one falls, the next one's going to fall. And the next one's going to fall. And the next one's going to fall. And that's what I think I heard you alluding to. Is that correct? Yeah. And then I am alluding it to the opposite of what you're saying. Okay, good. Okay, well, let's take it there. You're talking about existing systems. And they're right. all structured in a way that stuff comes in, stuff come out. We have unified, unified the production unit and, and whatever is wasted is wasted because that's non-core business. Waste is an external cost. Yes. What I've been researching for the last three years is that externalities can be cash flows so that, that a, a factory can literally operate as a living system, taking care of its, its place where it's, it is, like for its population, for the food, for clean water, for biomass production, for energy production. For me, that's effectiveness of what you do. You can be very efficient, um, which is reducing, uh, reducing cost, reducing waste, but in the end, you will always have waste. Okay, so what you're saying is basically every single existing business here is wasteful in some way. Always. And you're saying there are ways that when we stop we evaluate, we rethink our thinking, and we start getting out of our own way, we can basically reduce to eliminate the waste we've been creating in our existing structure. We can ev evolve up into something that doesn't, ex that's something that we can define and creates zero waste, an expenditure, a cost of doing business, if you will. Those can go away. You just Cost becomes a revenue. Tell us more about that. <laughs> um, so, for, for instance, I mean, there is a there is a whole notion about CO two, for instance. I mean, we, we, it's it's going to be a little bit scientific uh, chemistry, but most life consists of carbon. So, CO two is basically a feedstock. It's not an emission; it's a feedstock. If you emit CO two, you emit feedstock. And bacteria, which was one of the first ones living on this planet, they were actually capable of converting CO two into biochemicals. But it's the same with if your factory requires a lot of water, uh, you, you have wastewater. It's either 
polluted with uh, other chemicals or minerals or it's full of heat. Nature, you know, everybody knows the spiral in the bathtub. Yes. If you power that up, water will ultimately go back to four degrees, which is the highest density. And four degrees is cooler than 40 degrees. So suddenly your cool water is cooled down by the characteristics of water and then you can put it back into your factory. So the externality of wastewater then suddenly becomes an asset. Which would require then the thinking to recognize, I have a potential asset here. Who are the companies that can help me make this an asset? Because I do what I do really well, and I do not want to become an expert in cooling water to reuse it in my factory. There are people who do that. What I hear you talking about is a synergy between companies in a way to create revenue. That's the most fun game I'm busy every day with. <laughs> That's okay. That's cool. I, I, Federico is like, he's twitching back there. <laughs> what? Jump in, jump in. Yeah, my, my problem is that I could listen to Alexander for hours because he can take out some terrific science, but that's exactly the, the, the issue, the fact of waste and efficiency. So uh, we think that businesses today are the best at making the most efficient processes, but instead, since we have so much waste, that reminds me of, of a definition of waste that I've learned when I was studying at Harvard with Bob Kojacek, Waste is squandered corporate assets. So if you have waste, it's money of your companies that you are throwing away. If you have bought something and you have emissions, those that you put out as emissions are your resources that you are throwing away. And that's exactly why today we need to put together visionary leadership and science and technology. Because we have the science and technology, but we also have to bring back business leaders and all the people to change their way of thinking. The fact of saying that, oh, that's not my core business. I don't want to think about the science of recapturing CO2 as a feedstock. No, that's your duty today. Because today we have reduced margins. We cannot stand any more uh, we cannot endure anymore this level of waste, of pollution, and of squandering assets and resources. So it, it's, it's compelling today. And that's why the two things have to go together. Because we have the technology, the technology and the science are there, but we need leaders who have a mentality and a mindset to make the most of them and to dare to change without fear. And one last sentence, and then I shut up, is the big word that has been mentioned here and there is system, system thinking. We have to think back as part of an ecosystem. And that's the answer to the question that you were asking. How can we as humans, etc., etc.? We are part of an ecosystem, and we cannot behave as a very dangerous parasite anymore and there are opportunities of business and all the knowledge that is needed there can i add one th more thing onto that because you said a very nice one it's not your core business but actually if you're a steel manufacturer producing steel will be a secondary cash flow and producing biochemicals from the co2 will be a primary cash flow so what are you are you a biochemical factory or are you a steel factory and these are the questions which are now emerging with all these industries. Where, where, where is your core? Where is, what, is, what comes next? You guys, this is like caterpillar bursting out of its chrysalis to let its wings dry and fly away. It's interesting to think about that because I like the system thinking and the fact that we find ourselves in this gray area because I don't mind chaos. That's actually a cool place I like to play, chaos. This all these unknowns and, and thinking about them and, and figuring out what that might mean and how do we try something to find out if it would work for us, whatever us organization is. It's interesting that the systems thinking was everything we've talked about so far is us impacting other things that we touch. We don't really think about us in our existence and the bigger system that we are a part of. 
that somebody could be looking, I say somebody, that our climate, for example, our world, where we choose to go skiing, what kind of car do we drive, this bigger system, we tend to forget about that and not think about it. And here in the US, I know you guys are in Europe, here in the US, we have very progressive cities and very, well, less progressive cities when it comes to recycling, for example. The city that I live in, Boulder, is very progressive. We can put anything we want into this recycle bin, of course, but we have a list. So what happens with the stuff outside of the list? And this is interesting things. So like, for example, people who wear contacts, when they have these disposable contacts, you get them in these cases and they have those little foil pieces on top of them. You cannot recycle those individual foil pieces. You have to slowly save all these individual foil pieces and put them together to get them to a size that the recycling company can do something with. So how many people are actually going to do that, <laughs> that wear contact lenses in a city that's already pretty progressive? There's a limit to what's easy. What's, what do I have to work really hard at and what do I have to really work hard to do? And we tend toward taking the least resistance in a path. And so my question to you guys is, in terms of this concept of what we're talking about now, the systems thinking, sustainability, being visionary, it seems like the road less traveled more than an easy path. So are there ways that you are starting to work with your approach that make it easier for somebody to latch onto and go, yeah, that's not too hard. I can do that and get them on this path to thinking in this new way. It's an untrodden path, but it's also the most profitable that we have inside. There is a big responsibility in, in, in industry and in business about, for instance, the example that you made of, of context. I'm, I'm not specifically a technician, and I don't know that kind of industry. But for instance, think of coffee pots. They are one of the most unsustainable things on the market now, and they are very fashion, and there are billions and billions of them being sold and, and end up into landfills. But really, when I think of my father who is 91 and has Parkinson, I cannot really insist that it uses the very Italian mocha coffee maker because it's unpractical for him. So he uses coffee pots, and he, it generates a lot of waste. But anyway, until the, the company that makes the parts considers that waste is an externality and they don't care about that and it just gets thrown away, okay, this will go on forever until a point either we draw landfills or someone will put a tax on that waste and the company will go out of business. So, for instance, why don't we do something with discarded coffee and make it easy to extract from pots and do it maybe in another way. And we close the circle and, and, and we make a, a, a revenue stream from waste. And that would be a new business model. And I'm sure that Alexander can illustrate that much better. In Italy, uh, Lavezzo is collaborating with another Italian company, Novamont, and their coffee cups are 100% biodegradable in the compost. Previously, Jessica, you talked about those companies in the stock listed, how long they're there. Yeah. At, at the moment, those entrepreneurs or just ordinary people who see that the system is collapsing, it's not, as you mentioned, with the uh, contact lenses. My mind is already going, oh, maybe that, that, that could be an idea. Um, <laughs> but, so there are, there are so many um, uh, discrepancies in our system. And what we, want is, what we want is that waste becomes a resource. Recycling in itself is quite expensive because you, you have, the only option you have is to downgrade it. What basically you want to upgrade everything uh, cost-wise. But for instance, let's say contact lenses. I like the idea. So contact lenses, how long is it in the package? Maybe biodegradable foils can work um, because then you can throw it in your compost. Um, uh, I, I had a friend of mine, you have day lenses. Why not let day lenses merge in the water of your eyes? It's sold, and then after 24 hours, it's gone. And then you put new ones on. This is technology. This is innovating. This is it's looking for solutions because the current system of waste disposal is not functioning, or it has not been designed as such. If if you if you create a system where every output has a new input, waste does not exist because everything moves around in the system. 
Here's another interesting thing. And we're taught you both have mentioned compost in some capacity in the coffee example. And then also the contact example in Boulder, we have curbside compost because even if we compost it in our own backyard, there's so much that we carefully choose to buy that we reduce the amount of trash, the plastic we are unable to recycle and any sort of waste that we have that is potentially compostable. We tend to buy those products in our house. I tend to do that when I'm out and about as much as possible. However, we create a little too much compostable waste to be able to do it in our own backyard and let it go through its process fast enough. So we are lucky in the fact that we have this curbside stuff when trash goes out, the compost goes out, that's all that great. And our city has systems to do that for us en masse. But Jessica, for instance, um, composting, it's full of biochemical components. Yes. So the city is actually, a, could be a biorefinery. It could be. And in fact, when they get done, they actually give back to the community. They've composted everything. They sell a whole bunch and they give a whole bunch back to the community. What I'm saying is that Boulder could produce their own biochemicals from their organic waste. So you don't have to buy biochemicals anymore because the, the city, as long as you waste, you have biochemicals or with maggots, black soldier flies is a very good compost a composer turning yeah. them into fatty acids. Yeah. So as long as you have organic composting and you turn that into the nature's way of dealing with it, you have a biochemical factory. So every city is a biochemical factory. I want to put a pin in that and come back to it because where I was going was cities who don't have any sort of composting service. Where does it go? It goes in our landfills. It goes in our dumps, which actually is a whole different kind of problem. And it creates different kinds of problems for cities who don't do that or people who are trying to figure out what to do with these dumps. There are places that are across the United States, they smash them down and cover them up and they build houses on top of them or cities on top of them. Is that the best use or is there something else that for example, cities or organizations that run these dumps and have these landfills could consider as a potential next revenue to upgrade. Yeah, this is interesting when you talk about landfills. Um, there is a um, waste to energy factory in the Netherlands and the ones in Sweden. Sweden doesn't have any waste anymore. So in order to keep these factories running, they're taking the waste from Italy and the UK, eliminating their landfills and, and turning that into these factories. So that's that's an interesting concept what's going on. However, biogas is a very good solution in general, but all the other metal, aluminium, that is complicated. You need to sort that out before you put it in a landfill. If you go to landfill, that means that the local municipality has no technical solutions to find a better use for it. What is a biochemical? Let's, I wanna make sure that we have that defined for people who don't know what that is. Biodegradable by nature, the natural occurring chemical which exists in nature. It's feedstock okay. for nature. Let's make it more practical. Okay, feedstock for nature. For nature. Okay, good. Okay, all right. Now the leadership piece. Bring it, Federico. Well, it's more entrepreneurship anyway, but uh, we, we have a responsibility we, that are in, in the business world. We have to consider that uh, we have uh, a general problem of, of lack of political leadership around the world. So with the exception of a few uh, enlightened municipalities, there are many towns around the world that don't have very good waste management systems or programs. So now the responsibility has to be taken on by the business. And I think that what is very important that we can do is to show and help business to develop new opportunities for their business from the problem of waste. We transform a problem into an opportunity. In fact, think just about the, the fact that from Italy there is waste that is going all the way up to Sweden because Swedish can take out some value from there. It's just stupid to send rubbish from Italy to Sweden. You know how long way it is. So that tells us how much value there is there. And that's why I'm very much upset when I hear people talking about sustainability, that we have to be environmentally friendly. No, when we think that waste can become as a biochemical feedstock for nature, that means that we can produce something useful and full of value and rich in value from our waste. 
because we can produce protein that can be used to feed humans or, or animals. We can produce plastic. We can produce a lot of things, energy, a lot of things that we need. So business today has both responsibility and opportunity to exploit a lot of new revenue streams from thinking system, thinking sustainable, thinking circular. And that's very much why we operate jointly because there is the, the, the we, we kind of represent the bridge between entrepreneurship and, and science and technology. And putting the two together, we can change the way in which people look at the problem of waste, of the environment, the cost, et cetera, et cetera. So we've been talking about this systems thinking. We've been talking about vision. We've also been talking about this place of what we think we are versus what we are in this plane of existence that not very many people are playing in yet. Like the compost company turning into a biochemical producer, if you will. Like the technology of taking the contact lenses and coming up with a new technology so there's nothing left over. So there's nothing that we would have to figure out how to recycle or make that usable since we only have so many ways to do that in mass right now in many countries. Sweden happens to be our example and what I hear you guys saying, this is possible for every company. When we're talking about visionary pragmatism, the practi practical part is that innovation takes time. It has to go valley of death. It takes 10 years for innovation to become um, market rally, scalable, um, and be disruptive. Especially uh, talking <laughs> about con consumers, products. Um, and if you look now back to what people have been doing for the last 10 years, and you now see all these technologies coming on stream, it brings me so much hope and I'm getting goosebumps um, because these technologies are now being adopted by the big companies because they see the stranded assets now be turning into a revenue. You, you hear the guy who worked for 30 years and then he was an overnight success. That's what I heard you just say about innovation. Innovation is something that takes a decade. And then all of a sudden, there's this concept of disruption. So if we look around and we're worried our industry is being disrupted, the signs are there now. So we could see that coming is what I heard you say. And that's actually just good business awareness. Get our heads out of the sand, look around, understand what is impacting our business that is out of our control, that other people are innovating. And that last part, Jessica, is thinking, the, seeing the new system emerging. I also have some good news for businesses because, because innovation, of course, can take 10 years, but sustainability uh, integrated or embedded sustainability as a characteristic which is to pay for itself. So we have what we call the low-hanging fruits that can pay for the innovation in the short term. And we have wonderful experiences and example of this. One, for instance, is, is the case of Audi, the, the automotive uh, car maker, and they, they put in place this wonderful program that was giving incentive to the, uh, the workers and employees to develop process innovation. And in one year, they had savings in the processes for, I, I, if I remember well, it was 700 million euros and they paid in incentives 6 million euros to their employees who were very happy of the incentives, but the company just one year make, made a very huge profitable saving that could use, be used for innovation. And that's just an example, but there are plenty of case histories of these low hanging fruits that come from very, very simple innovation and changes that are that are created by the very people who work in organization that they have no cost basically, but they just come out of, of ingenuity of people and their experience that can pay for the long-term 10 year innovation that will be, as Alexander said, disruptive. And then there is completely new product process or business model. So it's, it's encouraging, I think, for business to know that there are these low hanging fruits. With technology moving so fast, is there a reason that it takes so long to have this technological disruption? Because we're seeing user technology and 
this is really okay. This is really hard because Lyft and Uber are popping into my head over and over and over again. It's they took a system that was relying on an old technology and they created a new way to do the same thing to get people moved around from place to place. And that seemed fairly quick. That did not seem like a 10 year we kind of saw it coming thing. So for people on the outside looking in, people who are not in manufacturing can still benefit from all of this. We need some context around the time, the fact that this takes time. And what can you tell us about that? I've been involved lately in many uh, events and organization about Industry 4.0. And what I hear from people who know very well technology, what they say is, actually, the technology of Industry 4.0 is a 20-year-old technology. It's not anything new. It's a new way of using it. So again, there can be, of course, disruption in time, but that's an ongoing process. What can be very quick is having people thinking and using their intelligence and come up with very smart ways of using the technologies that exist with maybe small improvements to make new businesses and to make profits. Now, to, to add on that, Frederico, um, if you, um, Jessica, the example of uh, Uber, Uber is basically a platform where supply and demand comes together. Isn't the taxi service the same thing though? Yeah, but it, basically they're, they're matching supply and demand. They're not producing anything. Okay. They're, they're, they're providing a service, but there is, there is no hardware being developed out of that context. Okay, so that's using the existing technology and actually just making use of it. Whereas would like going from a cassette to a CD be a better example where there's a production of a cassette that does recording and then to a CD? For me, this age is a battle of technologies. We know the story about Edison and Tesla. Edison won because he was a more commercial oriented guy and Tesla was a genius, but he had his own characteristics and was never, never successful in, in telling his story and the benefits. The US was one of the first electrified places in the world in the 1800s. There were already hotels, there were already, cars were already faster than, 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 um, than horses. Only some group of business people decided, you know what, a petrol engine and the system around the petrol diesel, if we roll it out faster than we do with electricity, we win. I mean, Elon Musk is doing the same with the electrification. He's, he's building factories and s making sure that the whole supply chain is organized in order to implement the whole system in one, in one go. If you take that analogy and, and, and take the uh, Uber technology and then look at SpaceX, for instance. Okay, good, yes. They never said reusable rockets were possible. I mean, it was science fiction. We know all these beautiful science fiction stories, but Elon was a programmer. So we can program a machine to come back. I mean, that's just finding the right software lines. And then you need to do something with the hardware technology to figure out how to get these rockets back to the planet because you need to figure out what you need for that. But he merged those two together and now these rockets come back every time over and over again. But the development of SpaceX was not something he did in a couple of years. And that also had a five to 10 years development period in order to get there. Thank you. I think that's a very good concrete example. And I want to keep listening to you both all day and we're running out of time, which is unfortunate. So we'll have to see about having you guys come back to talk more about this because we didn't even get to the water stuff, the whole flowy thing that we had originally talked about. And I would love to be able to come full circle to that as well. So I want to hear from you guys just today. Why is it bold? Why is it bold to recognize business is leaky today? Our business models have opportunities that we're not taking advantage of. Why is it bold for us to start thinking about them? It is a leap from what you were hinting before, the very common way of thinking, we want more for less. And in thinking, and I think it's very much the Elon Musk way of mind of thinking is, we think what we want that is appropriate with our objectives, and we go for the resources that we need for that. How about you, Alexander? Yeah, for me, leaky business means there's profit somewhere to be earned because you're losing opportunities. So as if you don't leak anymore, you've, you've resolved every leakage you can get and turn it into a cash flow. You've listened, you've watched, 
We are really glad that you are here today. Alexander and Federico are the type of guys that when they come back on the Voice of Bold Business, I want you to know right away. I want you to have this program delivered to your listening queue on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Play, whatever your preferred listening platform. So go and subscribe. Also, rate this program. How helpful is it to you? What else would you like to know about this? And take a look at and share with us your experiences around closing the gaps of where you could increase profitability by looking at the company differently. Now, we talked about a lot of things today, and I'm going to recap just a few because this is a really critical component of what we must do today to understand where the businesses we spend our money with are going and what they're doing, what we can do within our own organization to eliminate this cost of doing business, this waste for the benefit of ourselves, our employees, our customers, and our world. We talked about what visionary pragmatism is. We talked about what this concept of leakage is in business models. We talked about four ways that we can start thinking right now to consider moving toward this concept of a vision of change that may take five or six or 10 years to start to see the results of because what we actually do at our core today may transform into something else entirely when we look at the places we have our leakage. I would like to challenge you to take a look at what are the external costs that you have? Where is the waste that is generated within your organization? And find out and identify where you have a leaky business model. Subscribe at thevoiceofboldbusiness.com and get more information, program notes, and past episodes. Bold leaders approach each situation and focus on action to achieve a higher level of leadership. Jessica Duell, your business advocate, is the host of the Voice of Bold Business Radio. Thank you for joining us.